so that I remember to do that. Okay, everybody, welcome to uh, Lunch and Learn, uh, the March edition. Uh, my name is Al Gorman. I take care of programs and engagement here at the Carnegie Center for Art and History. And um, uh, we are a proud branch of the Floyd County Library. And one of the, the uh, reasons that we are uh, so interested in uh, having uh, Kelly Navy's uh, present is that this is one of those great opportunities where something that an important individual in the history of our town uh, intersects personally with her own family history. So I'm going to go ahead and, and read a little bit of, of Kelly's more formal uh, uh, biography here. Kelly Lane Davies is the museum specialist in oral history for the Smithsonian National Museum of African History and Culture. As such, she coordinates all aspects of the oral history initiative. Navy's journey as an oral historian began over 30 years ago when she was an undergraduate in African American studies at UC Berkeley. At UNC Chapel Hill, she studied and worked with the Southern Oral History Program. She also holds a master's in library and information science from the Catholic University of America. In addition to her work at the, uh, at the Smithsonian, Navy's own oral history projects can be accessed at the Southern Oral History Program, the Reginald F. Lewis Maryland Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Washington DC Public Library. Uh, as I, I feel, uh, kind of honored to uh, be uh, introducing a fellow library colleague and, and somebody uh, who I hope we get a chance to meet in public. So uh, without further introduction, uh, here's Kelly Navies. Good afternoon. Uh, let me share my screen first to make sure that we are on the right page here. Okay. Okay. So good afternoon, and I am so excited to be here. I would like to thank Albertus and the Carnegie Center for Art and History for inviting me. I was really excited to actually come to New Albany last April, but the pandemic had uh, other plans. I would love to be there and actually meet everyone in person. Before I begin, I want to give a little bit of information about, uh, a little more information about who I am and what I do. And shout out to all of my family and friends who, who have joined us today as well from all over the country. Um, I'm an oral historian, and I became an oral historian over 30 years ago, largely due to a story that was passed down to me from my mother, Constance Lane Gregory. Um, and this story was about her great grandmother who had been born in slavery in Asheville, North Carolina. And she had lived over 100 years and my mother had met her when she was a little girl. So she would tell me that, you know, my great grandmother was born a slave and I met her when I was a little girl. And, um, she didn't know much more about her, but this story always fascinated me. So when I became a, 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 an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, I decided to make this an oral history project. And I went, I went around and I interviewed um, family members who were still living at that time who had vivid memories of Elizabeth Gudger Stevens, who was born in Asheville, North Carolina, and lived to be 106 years old. And that's how I became an oral historian. And I've been doing this work ever since then. And currently as museum specialist in oral history at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, I coordinate all aspects of our oral history initiative. So that includes coordinating um, and um, it includes developing projects alongside and in collaboration with curators that support our exhibitions and research. It includes managing the collection and making it accessible to the public. It's, it's a, a wonderful job that I, I get to do uh, the work that I love. And I want to let you know before I forget, because it's uh, very um, relative to the, to the talk today, is that we are going to have a big um, exhibition on reconstruction opening in September of this year. Hopefully the museum itself will actually be open by then, but if not, uh, there will be information online as there is now. So if you haven't had a chance to please check out our website. It's not moving. Hold on. Okay. This story begins with my father for many reasons. My father, Richard Darrell Navies, um, we are investigating his mother, Rose Carter's uh, family line, but my father was a pioneering African-American studies instructor. 
Um, he, he was the director and the coordinator of the African-American Studies Department at Berkeley High School in Berkeley, California from 1970 until 1991 um, and his unfortunate um, demise due to leukemia. But my father was passionate about family. He was pas very passionate about heritage and African-American history and culture. And he passed that on to us. So this work that I'm doing now and really all of my work is imbued with his spirit and I, and I do it in that, in that manner. Kelly? Yes. Uh, we just had somebody, please check with Kelly if she's intending to share a PowerPoint because- You don't see it? We don't. Okay. Ah, that's the problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we thought, well, hopefully we'll catch it earlier. No, let me go back. Okay. Because it, it said I'm sharing, but let me do it again. I can okay. see it. If I, can, I can see it. I can see it. I don't see it. I see scheduling made easy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was it was up before, but I guess only some of us could see it. You're sharing the wrong screen. I can't see it. Okay, let me figure out what's going on around here. We went through this before. I don't know what's going on. Oh, it looks like there's Any two screens being shared. <laughs> Anybody um, feel like you're in elementary school Zoom? I know. <laughs> Let me. Uh, okay, it says if if you go to view options, then you can choose your. I know. I'm seeing. Okay. Screen. Yeah, but I don't know where the other one was coming from. Right. Is that what are you seeing now? I see. I see your program. Right. Me too. I see scheduling made easy. Yeah, that's what I see as well. You don't see Richard D. Navies. I no. don't. Not yeah, anymore. This is, oh, this is terrible. Okay. Oh, um, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Make it fast, make it easy. Okay, hold on. Okay. Okay, now I'm not sharing. Right. Uh oh. And if you're screen sharing, you need to share, right? not oh i think you're screen sharing so you need to stop. what are you seeing now the same thing i press share i'm doing it like i oh but but wait a minute before you share okay. you, you need to share. you need to get the screen yeah. you need to have yes. the your oh. content up and then now, I, I, I did have it up i mean we did this earlier and it was fine all right now try Yeah, the fault was mine. I I'm apologize. sorry, we lost a little bit of time there. Okay, that's I was uh, my saying fault. That. <laughs> we're still we're still admitting people to that. The fault was mine, uh, Kelly. I I still had my screen shared. Okay. okay. All right. So um, I was saying that this project begins really with my father and his, and his work as an African American history um, teacher and instructor in the, in the African American Studies Department at Berkeley High School and how it is imbued with his spirit. Let me move on because I wanna get through this material. He did not know, and that's one of the ironies of all of this is that he did not know about George Washington Carter and our connection to George Washington Carter. None of us knew that. We did not know about Hannibal so, Carter. If he had known, you can imagine that it would have been the subject of classes at Berkeley High School. But we did have, okay, now the screen isn't moving. This is too much. We did have this photograph. And this photograph was on a wall, a collage of family photos that my father had behind his desk. And I would spend hours looking at this photograph. I didn't really know the names. I knew this was my uh, great, great grandparents. Um, we assumed that the baby was Hannibal C. Carter, my great grandfather. And I would wonder you know, who these people were. And they looked important and very proud. And I and I intended at some point to do research, but I never got around to researching this particular um, branch of the family. But I guess the universe had other plans. About a year ago, actually in December of 2019, I was at my brother's house celebrating Kwanzaa, my brother Richard. And he called me to the side and he said, one of our cousins had given him a box of photographs to hold. He said, you've got to see these photographs. Um, and this was one of the photographs that we found. We went into his office and we started to unwrap 
these carefully preserved photographs that had been meticulously labeled. And we found this one and I'm, I couldn't scan it any better than this. And when the museum opens, I will hopefully be able to get a better scan. But this was just taken with my cell phone. Um, and this is Edward Eugene Carter. It was labeled on the back, Captain Edward Eugene Carter, my great, great grandfather. We recognize that, and I recognize that this was a Civil War photo. Um, we have photos like this, Ambrotype, um, at the museum in our military galleries. So I took some photos of this and some of the other things that were in the box, and um, I went on my way. And about a, a week later, when I was back at the museum, I ran into Kruoski Salter. Kruoski Salter is the military curator for the museum, and he put together our military gallery. So we were having some small talk. What did you do over the holidays and so forth? And I said, let me share this photo with you. And he looked at it and he became very serious. And he said, oh, those are captain stripes. Who's this? This, this is your, your great, great grandfather. What was his name again? He said, let me go look him up because I've written a book about black military officers. So a few days later, I get an email from him. And indeed, he found the name Edward Carter in his book, The Story of Black Military Officers. Now, <clears throat> this was the first time that we saw the name Hannibal Carter associated with Edward Carter. Now, remember, we have a great grandfather named Hannibal Carter, but this of course wouldn't be him. He wouldn't be in World War II with his own father, right? So I was, I, you know, something told me this was more than a coincidence. You can see the names uh, blown up there. Edward Carter, Hannibal Carter, they're all captains beneath the name of Andre Caillou, who is very famous. In fact, he's considered to be perhaps the first African-American commissioned officer to die in battle leading um, in the Civil War. Um, and it turns out that Edward Carter served with him in the Battle of Fort Hudson. So I saw the name Hannibal Carter and I thought, that can't be just a coincidence. Um, I went downstairs to the Robert F. Smith Family Center in the museum and I spoke to our staff there and they said, you need to go to the National Archives and pull up the pension records. So my brother Richard and I took a half day off of work and went to the National Archives. I was able to walk from the museum um, that day and there's a photo there of my brother when he met me. Um, he left his teaching job. And um, let me tell you, it was quite a day. So I had, of course, been to the National Archives Museum. I had been there for events, but I had actually never conducted research there. Um, you have to register and go through a brief training process and, and all of that. So after we did that um, and we gave the names to the clerk and we explained to her that we were looking for pension papers related to our great-great-grandfather, Edward Carter, and for Hannibal Carter that might be related. At this point, remember, we don't know if there's an actual connection between these two men. Um, and so she said, she went away, she came back. She says, well, for Hannibal Carter, we definitely have a file because he received his pension, but we may not have a file for Edward Carter because it looks like he applied but never received his pension. So, but she sent the request up anyway. And so we were like, oh no, I hope that's not true. And luckily for us, she was wrong. So. When we went and we were called into the Stacks research room, they brought out two huge files. And in fact, the files on Edward Carter were larger than the files on Hannibal Carter because he had attempted to apply for his pension before he died in 1890 unsuccessfully. And then his wife, my great-great-grandmother, Mary Victoria Carter, had applied mm. two, two other times. And so we had all of their application materials written in their lovely handwriting. And you can see um, examples of that here. If you can imagine the feeling of holding in your hand materials that were written over 100 years ago by your own ancestors and uh, beautiful writing and understanding that um, they were educated uh, for one and, and, and highly literate. There you see an enlarged um, Hannibal C. Carter's enlarged signature. So we this, remember this is towards the end of the day. So we are quickly reading through using our cell phone and an iPad to take photographs. Um, at the National Archives, this is an important bit of information. If you go in and scan using their materials, then what you scan, they will put online and you also get to take your own copies. But until that time, there, there are tons of materials like these that are not available digitally yet. So of course we plan to go back, but the pandemic hit and we haven't been able to do that. 
but to continue on with this story, um, we did find in each of the papers that each of the brothers had written about the other one, this is my brother. When I first read the line, Hannibal Carter was my brother, and the other one, I, I let out a yell in the room and everyone looked at me crazy. All the serious researchers were like, what is, what is their problem? Have they ever been to the National Archives? But we were so excited. So we kept reading and um, literally moments before we were kicked out um, because they closed at five o'clock, I read the line, I knew Hannibal Carter when he ran for Congress in 1882. And I wow. thought, what? <laughs> And, I, and, and it, we were being kicked out and I was like, Richie, do you see this? And um, I call him Richie, he's Richard. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, we had to leave. Um, and immediately we went up the street to the African-American Civil War Memorial on Vermont and U Street in Washington, DC. You can see a photo that we took, a selfie in front of that memorial. And on there behind the, the sculpture, you can see the names. They have all of the names of the over 200,000 um, United States colored troops are on this wall. So we were, were able to, fan, to find Edward Carter and Hannibal Carter's name on that wall. And you can see by our, wow. our cheesy grins, how excited we were to find that. But as soon as I got home, of course, I went to the internet. <clears throat> oh, but before I get to that part, I wanted to share. So now that we know that there was another Hannibal, these are the four generations of Hannibals in my family. Um, the top corner is my brother, Hannibal Carter Navies, born in 1977. And beside him is his son, who he named Hannibal Carter Navies as well. And we always just thought that he was named after our great grandfather. There's a picture of him there as a young man. Um, and on the back of that, that photo was scribbled the name Hannibal Carter Jr. And I found that before we knew any of this. And I was wondering, Jr., why Jr.? Well, now we know. He was named after his uncle, who you see in the bottom corner there, Captain Hannibal Carter, um, who lived from 18. Kelly, you went on mute. You're good now. Oh. There we go. Am yeah. I good? Yes, yes. So after that, I went to Google and I Googled simply Googled Hannibal Carter reconstruction. And you know, my mind is going crazy at this point. I'm thinking how easy it would have been if my father had lived into the era of the internet. He, he died before uh, any of this. So he wouldn't have been able to go and Google his ancestor in, in this fashion. But I Googled um, Hannibal C. Carter and of course discovered a wealth of information. I found Dee Dee Baldwin's website, muchado.net. This was the first time that and I, as I started reading through articles that I heard the name George Washington Carter, their father, George Washington Carter, the father of both Hannibal um, and Edward Carter. Um, I discovered with the help of my friend, um, George L. Marion Jr., who I believe is also out there, he was as, just as excited as I, as I was to, to find this information. And he's been assisting me with the research. He discovered the book by Pamela Peters on the Underground Railroad in Floyd County. And at that point we found entire chapters and pages devoted to the lives of George Washington Carter, Hannibal C. Carter, and our great-great-grandfather, Edward Carter. And um, then, of course, the information just started to flow. Um, but what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of what I've learned about the lives of all three of those, those men, Hannibal C. Carter, Edward Carter, and, and George Washington Carter. And now the screen is freezing up for me again. Hold on. Keep having to close it and open it up again. There we go. All right. This is fine. So Hannibal C. Carter, this is the only illustration that we have found for him. And I have been really looking. Um, I've reached out to Mississippi Archives, um, I've spoken to Dee Dee Baldwin about it. We are trying to locate another image, but this is the image that you will see printed over and over again. Um, this is the obituary that was from the appeal. And in this obituary, um, you find out a lot of information about uh, Hannibal C. Carter. He was born in 1835 in New Albany, Indiana to George Washington Carter and Ann Hill. And um, in 1861, Edward and George 
and Hannibal apparently took the Vicksburg, a steamer called the Vicksburg down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. We don't know exactly why they did that, but they were in New Orleans when Fort Sumter fell and the Civil War began. And at this time, the um, Carter brothers, Edward and Hannibal, both decide to join what is known as the Louisiana Native Guard. Now, the Louisiana Native Guard was formed to protect Louisiana property. And it was a part of the Confederacy actually. But the, the free men who joined the Louisiana Native Guard and they were all, it was all comprised of free men of color, never actually carried weapons, never actually fought for the Confederacy. Um, when the Union arrived, when Gen Gen General Butler arrived and New Orleans fell to the Union, Edward and Hannibal were two of the first men to show up and say that they wanted to join the Union and become soldiers. Uh, Butler at first was hesitant, but eventually he decides to accept the Louisiana Native Guard and they become the 73rd and 74th Infantry of the United States Colored Troops. And actually the more poetic name for the Guard was the Corps d'Afrique. Um, and at that point, the 73rd and 74th Infantry of which Hannibal and Edward are captains um, becomes not just free men of color, but also uh, runaway um, enslaved men joined as well. And <clears throat> Hannibal served in, in that force, but of course he encountered racism while he was in the force. And um, he was one of many who signed a petition in protest of unequal pay given to blacks. And according to Eric Foner, the, the noted reconstruction scholar, he was one of many officers that was purged and he ended up resigning about a year later on May 30th, 1863. However, after the war, he becomes very involved in reconstruction, this storied period of reconstruction. Um, and really, really, if you look at his life, it mirrors the ups and downs of this period when African-Americans strove to, uh, to breathe life into the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments and became active in politics on many different levels, but then also had to face the violent backlash of that period of post reconstruction. Uh, Hannibal Carter experienced all of that. After the war, he initially moved to Memphis and opened a saloon. And we found newspaper accounts where he was in a shootout with the Klan. Wow. Um, then he moves, that's my Aunt Cheryl out there. <laughs> then he moves to uh, Mississippi and becomes involved in politics there where he represents Warren County um, in their legislature in 1872 and 1873. I have a photo of the Mississippi legislature of 1874, 1875. He is not in it, but this is just a representation. And below that, you see a photo of the Corps d'Afrique. Um, again, uh, Neither of them is in this photo, uh, as far as I know. I'm not able to identify them in this photo. But as a legislature, he was instrumental in the passage of the Gray Carter Bill in 1873, which was a, a bill that addressed the rights of Blacks in public spaces. He had been refused the right to sit in a white section of the Angelo Concert Hall in Jackson, Mississippi. And so he secured a warrant for the arrest of the doorkeeper. This is a case that went all the way to the state Supreme Court and he won based upon the 14th Amendment. In 1882, he ran again for Congress in the second district and lost, but also in this year, which is very interesting um, and reflective of those times, there was an attempted assassination on his life. And this is what we're able to find in documentation. And I imagine that there were probably many such uh, conflicts and eventually he left uh, the South for Chicago saying that the South was not a safe place for a free man. Um, and he died in Chicago in 1904. This is Edward Eugene Carter, my, my great great grandfather, his brother, his younger brother, who was born in 1838 and actually born in Canada. And this is interesting because this is a detail that I had actually heard. I had heard that we had a connection to Canada and I had heard that there may be some connection to the Civil War and those two things didn't make sense in my mind. I remember thinking, how could this be? But it's, it's actually true that um, George Washington Carter was able to um, move back and forth between New Albany and Canada and educate a few of his children there and, and Edward was actually born there. And again, um, Edward was with his brother and father when they took that steamer down the Mississippi to New Orleans. 
and he joined the Louisiana Native Guard as well and became um, a captain and then also became a captain of the 73rd Infantry of the United States Color Troops where he served with distinction and was at Port Hudson. He went in, he led his men, his 90 men in and, was, and survived with only 20. Um, but he was injured during that battle. And it's an injury that as I read through the pension papers, it seems that the injury never actually went away. Um, a, a very big question is why did he, why was he unable to receive that pension? And I know there's a bigger story about the way African-American soldiers were treated during that time that needs to be explored. Um, he had three sons with Mary Victoria and in the pension papers, she wrote, she wrote the year that they met, the year that they were married. She also mentioned that he had been married previously and that his first wife died. And then she listed their three sons and the dates that they were born because this is all necessary for the application. And their three sons were Charles Lawrence, Hannibal Cleveland, my great grandfather, and John Montrose. And uh, Hannibal Cleveland Carter was born in August of 1883. And I actually got a chance to meet him before he died in, in 1975. <clears throat> so Edward Eugene um, became very active in reconstruction as well. It's not as well known as his brother, but he was involved on a local level. He was the state superintendent of schools in, in uh, uh, Mississippi, Tunica, Mississippi from 1872 to 1875. And then he was the clerk of the Chancery Court from 1876 to 1880. And there are newspaper accounts of his work there. Um, he, was, he was there during a, a race riot that took place around 1877. And I think he had sort of a, a, a mediating uh, role in that particular riot. Um, and he was also um, confronted with a resistance from Southern whites who did not want to take orders from him when he was the state superintendent, of, excuse me, when he was the superintendent of schools in Tunica. So there's some, some interesting documentation available. Here's one of the newspaper um, that we looked at from the Memphis Daily Appeal. If you search through the Memphis Daily Appeal, you find lots of accounts of his work in Tunica, Mississippi. He died at a young age. He died in 1890, um, probably due to some of those injuries that he incurred during the war. And I forgot to mention that he also resigned. Did he resign because of injuries or did he resign in support of his brother? More, more, more likely he resigned because of his brother. Now, Mary Victoria, who was left with three young sons, actually remarried twice. And I think this is perhaps why the Hannibal Carter piece was lost to our immediate family because she, she started two other families and maybe that, that particular piece was lost. That's what I imagine. George Washington Carter. This was a character. This was someone that I know that my father would have loved. Reading about him reminded me a lot of my dad. Though his life was undoubtedly marked by challenges and yes, tragedies of being black in the 19th century, this man born into slavery lived a very full and successful life that included a large family, uh, wealth, land ownership and political activity. We don't have any images of him. What I, what I have here, um, is a map that shows some of the territory, not all, that he was able to cover in his lifetime. And here is a photo, or excuse me, an illustration of the colored convention movement of which we have discovered he was involved in. So he was born in either 1801 or 1808 in Virginia. Um, I've seen both dates listed in some of the documentation. Um, in 1830, you find him already in New Albany uh, as the head of household, as a free black person. In 1832, we found a, a marriage document. He married Ann Hill. And, and if I mispronounce this, the name of this city, and then you're from Ohio, please forgive me, Chillicothe, Ohio, which I am learning more and more about each day. I had never heard of before this research, but Ann Hill was from a free black family in Chillicothe, Ohio. And they had several, several children, including Hannibal and Edward. They had daughters. Um, Susan and Ann and Mary, um, which are names that are family names, Harriet. Um, and his brother Edward actually married Ann's sister, Harriet, which is another interesting thing. And in, 18, in the 1850 census, you find them all living together 
in New Albany, along with someone named Moses Hurst, who was a figure in the Underground Railroad, just like George Washington Carter. Now, Pamela Peters' book details George Washington Carter's role in uh, the Underground Railroad. But first, let's, let's give an overview. So he, we know he came from Virginia, passed through Ohio, which it turns out that there were a number of uh, free black people and newly free black people who left Virginia for Chillicothe, Ohio and formed a strong um, community there. He ends up in New Albany, Indiana where he comes to town and purchases property. He owns a livery, a livery stable, He's a, he owns a barber shop, he's a barber and that's a whole nother story because barbers were masons and he was a mason as well. Um, he owns land along the Ohio River and that land he ends up selling to the city that becomes Fairview Cemetery, which is the cemetery that he is he's buried in. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, in Pam's book, you find out the, the interconnections between the free black community and abolitionists in New Albany and the, where they lived, how they lived close to each other, how they were close to the Ohio River, how being a barber enabled him to pass communication back and forth. Um, it's a very fascinating story. And Moses Hurst, who's living in his house in 1850, um, eventually marries um, his sister's daughter, but I'm getting ahead of myself because I didn't know this um, until very recently. More about George Washington Carter, we recently found that he was a local agent for the Colored Convention movement. He was at the 1844 Ohio Colored Convention. Um, and the color convention movement was a movement that preceded the Civil War, started in the early 19th century. These were free black men like Frederick Douglass, Martin Delaney, they were leaders of this, who were struggling for their civil rights before the Civil, the civil War. And they had annual gatherings. And um, this went on until about 1890. So we know that George Washington Carter, in addition to being a businessman, uh, being active in the Underground Railroad, was also a part of the colored convention movement. Um, there were race riots in New Albany, apparently in 1862, and his vineyard was destroyed. This would be during um, the Civil War, this, and not long after that, the family moved to, Louise, uh, to Louisville, right across the river in Ohio. Of course, I have a lot of questions about that, and that's so that's some of the research that still needs to be done. He, he did die of mysterious circumstances. He was found face down in 1878 in Silver Creek. And remember, I've never been to New Albany, so none of this is familiar to me, but I understand this is near Louisville and he had stepped off a train recently from Louisville and they found um, him face down um, in Silver Creek and no one knows exactly how he died in that manner. So just in the last few months, I found some other information um, about the origins of George Washington Carter. I was on Ancestry.com and I noticed that someone else had him in, her, in their tree. So I reached out and I discovered um, Lisa Schumann had been doing research. She wasn't a descendant, but she was researching a David Nickens. And David Nickens was a leader and a minister in Chillicothe, Ohio, who married a Serena Carter. In her research on Serena Carter, she discovered two obituaries that listed George Washington Carter um, as their sibling. Um, so these siblings were Susan Carter and John Carter, and we found obituaries. There were some inconsistencies with the year, but the names, John, Susan, Edward, all kept coming up. And it, it's, it's, we really believe that this is the family of George Washington Carter. We did further research and we found um, the will of a Martha Morris and this is where the story starts to get really interesting. And in that will, Martha Morris actually frees Serena and Susan, and, and she doesn't list the other siblings, but she, and this is in 1826, and she says that she's freeing Serena and Susan with financial support and their siblings and, 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 and the whole family and their mother, Sucky, um, which is also um, her, the nickname for Susan. Their mother was Sucky. So, we read on further and we find that um, their father was most likely the owner of that uh, plantation in um, Louisa County, Virginia, called Green Springs, and his name was Richard Morris. And Richard Morris, um, he knowingly fathered several children by an, a, a woman of color named Fanny Morris. And he actually leaves with her, he leaves Louisa County, Virginia, 
for, guess where, Louisville, Kentucky, and lives with her as a wife with their children. And, and their children became prominent free men of color in Louisville. And there's some very interesting parallels. So imagine if this is actually my great, great, great grandfather, then his children would be half brothers to George Washington Carter. Well, on one side of the river, you have George Washington Carter, who's a barber, who's active in the Underground Railroad, who's a business over. On the other side of the Ohio River in Louisville, you have Shelton Morris, who's also a barber, also actively involved in the Underground Railroad, also a Mason. And there are a lot of questions there. And the fact that they were both Masons, whether they were re actually related or not, you know that they were in contact with one another. So the story has gotten really interesting at this point. And this is really where I am now um, in terms of the research. Um, it, it, I have contacted the Louisa County Historical Society. I have looked at plantation records for the Morris family uh, plantation in Louisa. We found the name George listed. We haven't found anything definitively that says this is the George. So we're still looking. Now, of course, this is the point where African-American genealogical research becomes very difficult when you get to those slave plantation records when last names aren't always listed or ages. Um, so this is the difficult point that we've reached, but we've been very lucky so far because we're already back to the early 19th century. So there, um, after the pandemic, um, I do have plans to go out to the Louisa County or Historical Society um, in person to go through their records. I'm really looking forward to coming to New Albany and looking through records there, going to Mississippi, because I know that there's a lot more information to be found. Um, just want to give you sort of a rundown of, because a very interesting part of this research has been the recurring family names. These are family names, Hannibal, Edward, John, Charles, Anne and Mary, and Richard, Richard, my father and my brother's name. So if indeed Richard Morris is our ancestor, that is probably where that came from, um, ironically. Now, um, my, my grandmother's siblings were Annette, Mary, John, and Charles, and Richard. So you see these names recur throughout our family history. Many, many questions remain. Um, I, I was, I'm, I'm really curious to know um, the cause of George Washington Carter's death, for example. I, I wanna know why he sold land to the city of New Albany um, for that cemetery, which other than him is actually a, a white cemetery, if I'm correct. And um, they recently, and this is another, I, I always feel like there are greater forces at work, but only in November, they put a headstone up for George Washington Carter. That's literally a month before I discovered all of this information. So I think that's um, an interesting um, fact there. And um, I, I wanna know more about the women, of course, Mary Victoria and Ann Hill. Mary Victoria was also literate and educated in the 19th century. I don't know anything about her family. Ann Hill, I'm starting to learn, comes from a prominent free black family in Chillicothe, Ohio. Um, there are a number of questions to pursue and explore, but we are running out of time and I want to get questions. I, I have a few more photos of some of the descendants. Um, I remember Pam saying that we were the first, she thought maybe the first direct um, Carter descendants that she had met. There are many of us, although I would love to reunite with some of the descendants of some of the other siblings. Here you, you see, um, this is an older photo of my great-grandfather, Hannibal Carter, with his wife, Rosa Bell. This is their 50th anniversary photograph. Um, this is uh, John Montrose in World War I. And here's John Montrose here as a younger man. This is Charles Lawrence. Uh, this is my grandmother, Rose Carter, my father as an infant, um, and her um, and his older brother, Edward. There's the name Edward again. And um, I will close there. Uh, thank you for your patience with the technical difficulty, and uh, let's have questions. All right. Can you hear me, uh, Kelly? Let yes. Me see. Okay. Uh, let's see, is everybody else still muted maybe? Okay. We've had po folks uh, wanting to know whether uh, this, this talk is being recorded and it is. 
And, and so uh, uh, I think my colleague Laura has shared uh, uh, where you can find that once we get it converted. Okay. Right. Mm, Kelly, see. one of the things that I'm really interested uh, in finding out more about is his relationship with uh, Shelton Morris. Because yes. I know from uh, researchers in Louisville, that Shelton Morris was definitely involved in many ways in helping helping freedom seekers uh, across the river, and they, that's there's got to be a connection, uh, especially Absolutely. with Francis Hurst. Uh, living with George and having been arrested for helping slaves, he must have been very active in helping um, Shelton. Uh, and, and the fact that they were both barbers, I mean, there are just so many connections there. Yes. Did you ever find anything out more out about uh, George Washington Carter's relationship to Shelton? I'd really like to know. Yeah, we are definitely pursuing that lead. Um, I, I know there has to be a connection there. Now, of course, if they were doing their jobs well, it would be hard to find that information <laughs> because it was supposed to be hidden. It was so that that's the difficulty here. But I'm surprised at how much we've been able to find anyway. So I, I will keep looking. Yeah, I think um, it's it's been amazing to me what is available now. You know, as they start to digitize all these materials, I, I began research, and of course, I know you remember prior to the internet when you had to write letters to librarians and ask them to look through newspapers for you and look through the microfilm and things right. like completely different. I would have, this would have taken me five to 10 years to do 20 years ago. <laughs> so. We, we have a question in the chat feature. <clears throat> it's, uh, you're getting a lot of thank yous, uh, but how old would Hannibal and Edward have been when George was killed? 1878, uh, that was after the war. So uh, they were both in Mississippi by that time. Um, they would have been in their 40s. Yeah. I, I it's a personally... good question because I, and I, I, I wondered that as well, like what, how, how that affected decisions that they were making. Um, and I know that, and I, and I also was putting together that um, Edward died in 1890 and then Hannibal left the South around that time as well. And I, I wonder if that had a lot to do with him deciding to leave the South. And the circumstances of Edward's death are somewhat of a mystery as well. I don't know the cause of his death either and why he was never able to get that pension. So, and there's so many um, rampant, uh, the violence against African-Americans during that period was, was rampant and unchecked. So you know, there, it's, it's an interesting story to pursue. Uh, I'm sorry, niece, this is your, your uncle Chuck. I was hey. uh, curious. I, hey, fantastic job! I, I, I honestly believe that uh, Henry Louis Gates may be on your on your uh, <laughs> in, in touch with you very soon. For this is serious. Charles <laughs> Navies, you guys. Another one of those Charles is in my family. This is Charles, my dad's brother. Well, thank you for the acknowledgement. <laughs> you know, I was fascinated earlier, niece, when you told when you told me personally about the uh, well part of uh, I guess what uh, Dee Dee I, I'm very pleased by the way that see the collaboration between you two I, I actually I, I was unaware that you knew who she was prior to the time that I I, I, I mentioned right. you I had I found her, her website her website is the first one of the first websites you see when you do the search yeah so I had I had found her website but I didn't know her personally until you made the introduction so thank so, you you know what I, I feel very very happy about that acknowledgement and here, here's the thing I, I was just curious about one aspect of uh, I'm I can't forget whether it was Edward or Hannibal who was involved with the negotiations from what I understand uh, on behalf of free free blacks uh, in relationship to the to three territories and in, in yes, the that's Hannibal. That's Hannibal. Yeah, the Oklahoma Territory. Yes. Yeah. Well, the fact that he played a role in those negotiations is, is absolutely incredible. Yes, it is. And interesting how much of this is still relevant today, actually. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, last little point was the fact that, from what I understand, and the way you uh, so uh, amply put it. Uh, when you first started talking about uh, some of some of their activities, you know, during the time, 
was the fact that apparently he was a he was a sort of a political animal, uh, Chicago. Uh, yes. And how he could sort of he get away with those political. Yes, I, had, I wrapped it up a little bit, but yes, he was still involved in politics yeah. up until his death. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. He switched parties. So he ended up run. switching. He switched from yeah. the Republican Party to the Democratic Party before he died. Uh, well, there's a there's a juicy story there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they may have run him out of the South, but he continued his work in the North. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. But fantastic job, fantastic job. Yes. Absolutely. There's some other things that uh, in my newspaper research, when I was looking for information about the Carters, there's some other stories, hidden stories. There's one, for example, um, the New Albany Daily Ledger was extremely uh, anti-Black bias. Yes. And so they were always poking, he was always, the editor was always poking fun and uh, saying negative things kind of under the table, undercover about Blacks. Um, and one thing he said about the Carter Barber Shop, and he was talking about Edward and Hannibal, who both worked there for their dad for a period of time. He said, they're used to fire and brimstones down there at that barber shop. Now, that's all it said. And I don't know what he, what the editor of the paper meant about that. <laughs> yeah, and we'll never know <laughs> what he meant, yeah. but there's definitely, yeah, that, yeah. You we could even, certainly imagine. You have to read between the lines. Yes, you have to read between the certainly. lines when you're yes. just looking at those media accounts. We can yeah, certainly absolutely. imagine. Yes. I, I think yes. it's fascinating that both Edward and Hannibal were educated in Canada. It is. You and know, that's and another it's... question I'd like to pursue. Um, yeah, I'd like to find out where exactly they were. I know in, in general, but not specifically, like what, what, what institution. Uh, and, and I wonder if that place still exists today. And if there are other, I'm sure there's some other record of a family um, in Canada. So there are many places that I need to go um, to, pursue, to pursue this story. Okay. It says so much about the lives of, of African Americans during this time that we aren't aware of. And that, and I, I forgot to mention that in addition to traveling back and forth to Canada, George Washington Carter was also in the gold rush, in California in 1850. Mm. He's he was there. And, and so that was, that's another little interesting fact. So he's traveling from New Albany to California, to Mississippi, New Orleans, to Canada, back and forth to Ohio in, in the 19th century. It's Maybe that's recent. where I got the, the gold bug from. Maybe that's where I got the- uh... <laughs> For the moving bug. <laughs> I was explaining to, uh, to Albertus before we began all the different places that our family and you can see just from the people joining the talk, we're all over the country. So I didn't know about the, the Indiana connection because after Mississippi, Mary Victoria, Mary Victoria moves to Memphis. Um, she raises her children in Memphis. Then they moved to St. Louis, which is where my grandmother was born and where my father was born. So I did not know anything about Mississippi or New Albany. I knew about Memphis. Um, so that's why we lost that particular connection. And then from there, they moved to Detroit. I was born in Detroit. So we have Detroiters out there today. And then my father moves to California with my, with my mother and my three brothers were all born in California. So we have people from California, Florida, Detroit, St. Louis, everyone is out there today. So <laughs> something else, yes. story of, of migration. And well, your story has that. resonated with our audience, and uh, there are some really great uh, uh, people uh, suggesting when the when is your book going to come out, kind of thing, and uh, <laughs> so you'll get a kick out of those. Uh, what about the event in Green Springs? Right. Green Springs. Remind me again where Green Springs is. Louisa County, Virginia. Okay. Yes, it's Louisa County, Virginia, and the Historical Society is actually open. I've been waiting for it to warm up. And I plan to go there in the next few weeks in person, actually. The staff so nicely uh, sent me tons of information um, at my request. Um, but I, I, I want to go there and look through some materials in person. Awesome. Yes. Well, we any, have any more uh, questions? about five minutes or so left. Well, here's a last photo here. These okay. are, this is me and my three brothers, a uh, recent photo 
taken during the pandemic um, in, in, at Hannibal's home in Atlanta, Georgia, which is another place we have family now, Georgia, because I, I have two brothers in Georgia and a brother here in the DC, Maryland area with me, so. So can you offer any advice to uh, anybody who might be uh, interested in, in researching their story a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, do it, do it now and talk to all of your living elders, start there. I was, I was very lucky when I started the project on my mother's family that uh, my grandmother's siblings were all still living at that time and they all had vivid memories of their grandmother. So that's where I started. If you have elders that are still around that you can talk to, sit them down, start there, talk to them and find out everything you can. Record it and get it down. I'm, you know, I'm an oral historian, so I start there. And then of course, pursue the documentation. And now more and more of that documentation is available. Measure. Thank you for listening in. Um, yes. So there's more and more of that documentation is available um, um, and being made available online. Of course, you, and still in many cases, you have to go in person. I'm lucky that I was able to get to the National Archives because those pinch, all of those pension papers are not um, digitized, um, only the military records. You can find the military record um, of George and Hannibal, but not those, not those extensive pension papers. And the only way those will be digitized are when we go back we'll have to scan them and which is what we plan to do. And hopefully they will be open soon. But um, just to think that all that history is just sitting there in that building. Um, I, I'd say now it's e easier than ever. Uh, we have a family history center at our museum. You can contact them for um, assistance in genealogical research. Um, there are, there's ancestry.com, which has been a great help to me um, in terms of just pulling together a lot of this documentation, uh, the census, birth records, marriage records, all of those different things that you're able to access through, this, through the site. And so I would recommend it. Some people say, is it worth it? it actually, in this case, I would say, yes, it, it has been worth it because I've, I've been able to find a lot more information by utilizing that site. So yeah, there, there's a lot that, that you can do. And, and I, I think everyone, should do their family history and, and everyone should do oral history as well, which is a, a whole other talk that I could give about the power of oral history, but I recommend that everyone do that. We'll have to sign you up for that one at some future point. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm really interested sure. in oral history, right? Because we, we prioritize what gets written down so heavily, right? And we know that there, there are sources of information and cultures around the world that are communicated more orally than in written. So you're, that'll be a, a cool talk that we can maybe get you involved in. <laughs> Absolutely. But, I mean, that's, that's what I do uh, more than I, you know, more, than, more often is I do talks about oral history. So yeah, I would be happy to do that anytime. Oh, that is so great that uh, here in Little Floyd County uh, in our library that we can connect with you, uh, Kelly, that has been so wonderful for us. Uh, we just to remind folks who are in our area, please come on by. We are open and free and heavily sanitized, so you will be fine. And come and see this exhibition on George Morrison. We also have a really wonderful virtual uh, field trip that we've made for the, the kids in our local school system who couldn't go to the actual on-site field trips that they would do this year. And, and so we produced a video and have distributed that with uh, the local schools. And we've had 1,200 kids see it. So that's, that's great. Um, I, I guess any last questions before we sign off? Just to remind folks again that uh, this talk has been recorded and you can get access to it by getting hold of us. Kelly, uh, thank Kelly, you. Kelly, so we're looking forward to you coming to New Albany. I'm looking forward to that. I think I can get there this summer. I'm really hoping to come there yeah. this summer. So, so look for me. Mr. Gorman, you've done a great job as a moderator, sir. Well, I'm. Uh, I thank you, sir. I appreciate your patience. I wish I was, uh, you know, uh, somebody more adept at the technology here. But I love to talk, and I I love a good story. And and Kelly has a really great one, and we appreciate her coming aboard. And you too for tuning in. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hi. We'll see you at the Smithsonian, niece. Yes, I'll see you at the Smithsonian. I hope to see all of you at the Smithsonian when we open up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. We're celebrating our fifth anniversary in September. So hopefully by then we'll be. Oh, open. I just wanted to say you one can come and check out the reconstruction exhibition. Well, you know, that one sculpture that you showed the Ed Hamilton spirit for freedom that was yes. made here. Oh, really? All in New Louisville. 
I'll say just across the river. I say okay. here because we, it seems like an interchangeable community at times. Isn't that something? I didn't know that. But Ed Thank Hamilton you. is a Louisville sculptor and uh, he created that piece. I watched it being made from clay to bronze. It was cool. Thank you again. Excellent. Uh, Pam, right. thank thanks you. everyone. All right, thanks everybody. You guys have a great rest Bye. of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Oh, bye, Kelly. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Kelly. Great job. Thanks, bye. Kelly. Is that Stephanie? Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>